Hey, what's going on everyone? My name is Grace. Welcome to my channel. Today's video is four facts about John Adams and more. This is part of an ongoing series where I tell y'all about four facts about each US president that seems pretty interesting or crazy, but also something you guys might not know about that president. And with that, let's get into this video. Before we start with these four facts, I also want to give some basic facts about John Adams for people who are not familiar with him. He was born on October 30th, 1735 in Quincy, Massachusetts and died on July 4th, 1826 in Quincy, Massachusetts due to a stroke on the House floor while presenting a debate on whether to refer to a resolution to the Committee on Military Affairs. He did die on July 4th, which is Independence Day in the United States, in particular in 1826. This was the 50th anniversary of the Declaration of Independence. Another crazy thing is that he and a founding father and president, Thomas Jefferson, also died on July 4th, 1826. Adams was raised as a Congregationalist, but then turned to Unitarianism. And I'm sorry if I'm not pronouncing that right. Over time, he seemed to grow uncertain about Christianity and all religions, about their beliefs and practices. Some of the jobs Adams served before becoming president was he was a lawyer, a diplomat, and a vice president to the first president, George Washington. Adams served two terms as the first vice president, but he only served one term as the second president. He served two terms and it was between 1789 through 1797 as vice president and between 1797 and 1801 as president. His vice president was Thomas Jefferson, who opposed Adams in the 1796 presidential election. Until the ratification of the 12th Amendment in 1804, the runner-up in the presidential election automatically became the vice president. So imagine if the 12th Amendment didn't exist in the 2016 election, Donald Trump would be president and Hillary Clinton would be the vice president. Very controversial stuff. <laughs> Adams was a member of the Federalist Party. During his first and only presidential term, Adams won 71 electoral votes while Jefferson won 68. Other people were running in this election too, but Adams and Jefferson had the most electoral votes. And Q, now that I got that off my plate, let's begin with these four facts. Number one, he wanted the president to be addressed as His Highness. Back when Adams was vice president for Washington, Adams suggested that the president should be addressed as His Majesty or His Highness. This was back in 1789 when Washington first became president and the United States was a brand new country. In the end, Congress and Washington agreed the president should just be addressed as the President of the United States because His Majesty or His Highness was a little too royal. Plus, they just got out of this monarch government, which was England, and created this brand new form of government. Washington knew this wouldn't set well with the newly formed United States, so he stuck with the title President of the United States, which we still use to this day. Number two, Adams didn't like slavery. If y'all watched my last video about George Washington, one, I suggest you do if you haven't, and two, I gave a good breakdown on slavery back then-ish and how it was seen as normal. Even back then, people still had a vast amount of opinions about slavery and the morals behind it. Adams opposed slavery as a whole, morally and politically. Even in a letter, Adams wrote, Every measure of prudence, therefore, ought to be assumed for the eventual total extirpation of slavery from the United States. I have, through my whole life, held the practice of slavery in abhorrence. Even when Adams lived in the White House, he hired white and free African Americans to work for him and his family. There are rumors that the Adams family might have hired enslaved African Americans to work in the president's and vice president's houses for pay. And when I mean pay, I mean they pay the people who own the slaves. Since Washington DC is in the middle of Virginia, a pro-slavery state aka where George Washington is from, if you didn't watch my last video, and Maryland, a borderline state where there are lots of pro-slavery and not pro-slavery people, there could have been a chance he did use enslaved people around the White House. How sure are scholars and we of it? We are not 110% sure. 
The second president, John Adams, was the first president to live in the White House. The first capital of the United States was New York, New York City in 1789 when George Washington took the oath of office and it only lasted for a year. The second capital got moved to Philadelphia, Pennsylvania in 1790. Before John Adams became president, George Washington lived in a house in Philadelphia named the President's House between 1790 and 1797. John Adams moved in shortly after he became president between 1797 and 1800 before being located in Washington, D.C. Between 1790 and 1800, Philadelphia was the capital of the United States. In 1800, the capital was moved to the District of Columbia, a.k.a. Washington, D.C. The White House in Washington, D.C. started construction in 1792, in 1800, when it was still under construction. And yes, enslaved people did help construct the White House. Also, unfortunately for him, he was defeated in his term of re-election by Thomas Jefferson, also known as his vice president. So he barely lived in the White House officially for about four months. Our last fact is that he defended British soldiers who were accused of being responsible for the Boston Massacre. Let's start off by defining what the Boston Massacre is, which is a key event that leads up to the Revolutionary War. The Boston Massacre occurred on March 5th, 1770. Leading up to the Boston Massacre, a lot of American colonies were really mad about receiving taxes from Britain, most notably the Stamp Act in 1765, along with a series of acts called the Townshend Act in 1767. There were a lot of Patriot colonists who opposed the taxes and Loyalist colonists who were, of course, still loyal to Britain. Before the Boston Massacre, there were already protests and violence erupting, but the Boston Massacre just made it clear how bad it was and how mad the Patriot colonists were getting. There was a heavy amount of British soldiers occupying Boston as well, which made things a lot more intimidating and unwelcoming. So this just turned into a street fight, starting with a British soldier who was on guard duty and a big amount of Patriot colonists. What the Patriot colonists started to do was allegedly throw snowballs, stones, and sticks at this British soldier then backup came in from the British soldiers. When the backup came in, so did more Patriot colonists, and allegedly, the Patriot colonists started to become more violent and aggressive by mocking and throwing objects at them. The British soldiers opened fire and resulted in killing five Patriot colonists. Okay, so remember when I said Adams was a lawyer before becoming president, right? Well, the soldiers were represented by John Adams and Josiah Quincy II. Adams and Quincy took on the challenge and volunteered to show that the colonies could show that they could put on a fair trial. They represented nine British soldiers charged with manslaughter. He even described the Patriot colonists as a motley rabble as a way of self-defense for the British soldiers. After the trial, seven of the nine soldiers were freed and two soldiers were guilty of manslaughter and were branded with an M as punishment but did not go to prison. In his involvement, Adams described it was one of the most gallant, generous, manly, and disinterested actions of my whole life, as one of the best pieces of service I have ever rendered my country. While Adams did oppose what the British were doing, he believed in the rule of law and fairness. Alrighty, thanks for watching my video, everyone. Make sure you subscribe and click the bell notifications to look out for some of my future videos, and I'll see y'all later. Peace.